wonder, last week it was Easter, as I'm sure you know. You might have eaten a lot of chocolate in the last week. I know I have. It was Easter, and we celebrated the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I wonder how you would describe in words what the resurrection of Jesus means for you and how it changes lives. How does the resurrection of Jesus change people's lives? There's been all sorts of things like kind of written about it. There's been poems, songs, books, films about it, of people trying to sum up what it means and uh, what, what, what happens as a result of the resurrection of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I don't always find it easy to explain that to people, to sum it up in a nice little package of what it means for us that Jesus rose again. But I am personally a big fan of hearing stories and hearing examples of people's stories of what Jesus has done for them. Because I think that a lot of the time, the resurrection power is seen through people's stories. It's seen through how it changes lives. So I love listening to people's stories of how their lives have been changed because of Jesus. And that's actually one of the ways that I think I've probably got to know Jesus best. And today, the good news is that we are going to look at a story just like that. For me, this is one of the most beautiful depictions of how Jesus and the truth of his death and resurrection changes this guy's life and changes our lives as well. So it's in John chapter 21. And in my Bible, it has a heading, Jesus reinstates Peter. Or in the Passion Translation, which is another translation of the Bible, it says, Jesus restores Peter. And we're going to look at Peter's story today, see what Jesus did for him. Because I think that this story is a picture of what Jesus came to do and what Jesus is able to do for us. So what I want us to take Peter's name away from that story just for a minute, from that title. And I think what we're left with is this message that we see all over the Easter story in all the interactions that Jesus has with people. And it's what he longs to do for us. Jesus restores. There was a period of 40 days between when Jesus resurrected and when he ascended. And he appeared to some different people in that time. And they're called the resurrection appearances. And this is one of those stories of what Jesus chooses to do in that time. Jesus restores Peter. But to understand what is going on exactly here for Peter, I think we need to rewind a little bit to get a bit of context of Peter's life. You might remember that Peter has not always been called Peter, which is a little bit confusing, but bear with me. Peter was once called Simon. But in Matthew 16, we read that Jesus has renamed him, which I think is pretty cool for Jesus to give you a new name. And his new name was Peter. And Peter means rock. In the Greek word, it means rock. And the reason Jesus renames Simon Peter is because he says that Peter is the rock on which he is going to build his church. He gives him this amazing, immense authority and responsibility. And this moment comes just after Peter has acknowledged that Jesus is Lord ahead of some of the other disciples. Peter is on fire. His future is looking bright. Throughout Jesus's ministry, in fact, he is one of Jesus's closest three disciples. He's kind of like in his inner circle. He's following Jesus around, seeing all these miracles, watching Jesus do amazing things. He was even there at the transfiguration, which is another cool claim. He really, really loves Jesus. So he seems to be living his best life. Yet, as you might also remember, Peter has this moment of deep failure. When Jesus has been arrested and is being led away, Peter denies that he knows Jesus three times. He is overcome, probably, I imagine, with fear, and he takes a bit of an easy route out. He refuses to even associate with Jesus. He says that he doesn't know him when he's asked. And Jesus had predicted that that would happen, and Peter said that he would never do that. He was so sure that it wouldn't, but it does. And then after the third denial, Jesus looks at Peter, and Peter is crushed he realizes immediately what has happened, what he has done. And his reaction, well, he goes outside and he weeps bitterly. He's failed his test of allegiance to Jesus. 
And that's where we are when we get to our passage in John chapter 21. And if you've got a Bible with you, I would really encourage you to get it out. Or you might have your phone with a Bible app or Google will also find you the passage. So it's John 21. I'd really encourage you to get it out either at home or in the building if you can. Because I just think it's great to be able to read along and follow this story together. So I'll give you a moment to do that. So John 21, verse 1 onwards says this. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat but that night they caught nothing. So Peter here is with some of the other disciples and he decides to go fishing. And that is important to note because Peter, before he chose to follow Jesus, was a fisherman. That was his career. It was what he did. So it might seem fairly normal in this moment to find him out in his boat fishing. But the thing is, when Jesus had called Peter to follow him, and he had given his life to following Jesus. He had left behind his career of fishing. I can't see any um, examples of times in when he was following Jesus that he went on a fishing trip. He seems to have left it behind to follow Jesus instead. But now, in this moment, he is back fishing. I wonder what Peter was going through in those days. I wonder how he felt, what was going on. I imagine he was probably covered in shame. Peter was once known as that guy, that guy who loved Jesus, that guy Jesus had given authority to, even given him a new name. He had said he would use him to build his church. But now, just a few days later, Peter had become that guy for all the wrong reasons. He was that guy that had denied knowing Jesus, that guy that had betrayed him, although he said he never would. And Peter's response is to go back to doing what he knows best, fishing. Perhaps he is trying to busy himself. Maybe he's trying to distract himself. Perhaps he's trying to rediscover some sort of purpose for his life after having lost, it seems, all that he had just days before when he was living his life for Jesus. Here's what happens next. From verse 4 onwards, it says this. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. So Jesus appears on the beach. Now, Peter and the other disciples are not having the most successful time out fishing. They actually haven't caught any fish all night. But Jesus appears and tells them to throw their net to the other side where they will be able to find fish. Now, they didn't actually recognize Jesus at this point. You would think that maybe they would after spending years with him, but they didn't. But what they did do is follow his advice and they put the net out the other side, and then they could not haul the net in because they'd caught so many fish. You might be thinking that you recognize this scene. It sounds familiar. And that is because this, almost this exact scene has happened before. In fact, it is the same miracle that was performed by Jesus when he first called Peter to follow him, or Simon as he was known then. You can read it in Luke chapter 5 if you want to have a look. The scene is at the Lake of Gennesaret, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. And Simon Peter has been fishing all night and hasn't caught any fish. But Jesus told him to put his net into the water on the other side. And guess what happened? They caught so many fish that their nets began to break. And Simon Peter was so astonished that he recognized Jesus as Lord and left everything he knew to follow him. It's the same scene. And so then when Peter 
has this moment of failure and shame is covering him. Jesus comes and meets him again in the same way that he did at the start. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence. There's all sorts of ways, I'm sure, that Jesus could have chosen to met with them. But I think that Jesus wants Peter to know in this moment the door is still open to him. It's a bit like he's saying, hey, Peter, remember when I called you to follow me? Remember when I did this? Well, here I am again, Peter. Here I am. Come and follow me again. He is recreating the same opportunity that he had once given Peter. And the disciples the second time round also seem to have this slight deja vu moment because as soon as they witness the miracle, they recognize Jesus on the beach and Peter jumps in the water and swims to shore and the others follow. And this is what happens next from verse 9 onwards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. So on the beach, basically, Jesus has got a bit of a barbecue going. And he invites them to come and eat breakfast with him. I wonder how Peter would have felt in that moment. I think if I was Peter, to be honest, I probably would have felt quite awkward. I wonder whether he thought that he was welcome to come and eat breakfast with Jesus. I wonder whether he would have chosen the seat next to Jesus or perhaps he would have sat a bit further away, kind of hesitant, unsure about whether he too was welcome there. There was the biggest elephant imaginable in the room. Peter was that guy who had denied Jesus. And here they all were having breakfast together. But all of this was setting the moment. Jesus setting Peter up for this conversation that we read between the two of them after they have eaten breakfast. Jesus finally addresses this elephant in the room. And we read this conversation in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. As I was looking at this passage, it struck me that surely Jesus could have forgiven Peter in an instant if he wanted to. We'd seen it all throughout the Gospels. Jesus has the power and the ability to heal and forgive just like that. He's done it before, but he seems to drag it out. I think we could read this and conclude all sorts of things. Did Jesus want Peter to feel bad for what he'd done? Did he want to antagonize him? Why did he have to drag it out? I think that the pain that Peter felt in this moment went deeper than just feeling guilt and feeling bad for what had happened. I think he was crushed under the weight of his shame. People say that guilt is feeling bad about something you've done and shame is feeling bad about who you are. And I think that Peter wasn't just feeling guilt, but he was actually feeling shame in that moment. And I think that Jesus, Jesus knew that. He knew the depth of the pain that Peter felt having let him down just days before. And I think that that is why Jesus chose to meet him in this way. When you have got a deep wound on your body, just a bit of medical advice, I'm not a doctor, but I feel like this is just general knowledge, that when you've got a deep wound, you can't expect most of the time a quick fix. Most of the time, you can't just put a plaster or a bandage on something and expect it to all be healed instantly. Often, you should clean the wound, you should um, clean it out before you dress it. 
if you just put a plaster over it, it might be less painful. You might not have to, has anyone had that TCP, like, oh, horrible TCP when you have to rub that into a wound and it stings so much. But if you don't clean it, then you are probably going to end up with an infection. And Peter has this deep emotional wound. I think that Jesus knew that in order to heal Peter, there was a process that needed to happen. I think that Jesus wants to give him more than forgiveness. He wants to give him restoration. Jesus restores. He forgives and he restores. And when Jesus heals, he doesn't just do it by putting a plaster over things. He wants to heal our wounds at the deepest points. And to do that, he needs to come into them. So Jesus has recreated this scene where he first called Peter to follow him because he is demonstrating that the door is still open for Peter. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't need to address the pain of what has happened. And so there is actually another scene that is recreated. We read that on the beach, Jesus was cooking breakfast on a fire of burning coals. And the original Greek word used here for the type of fire this was, a charcoal fire, is only used one other time throughout the whole New Testament. And that time is the moment when Peter denies Jesus. When he denies knowing Jesus, he is stood by a coal fire, that same word for a charcoal fire, warming himself. And so Jesus recreates this moment of betrayal, the moment of failure, so that Peter can be redeemed. He doesn't do it to ridicule him, but to restore him. He takes him back. Because Jesus had told Peter that there were amazing plans for his life. He was to be instrumental in building the kingdom of God. And Jesus wants to restore Peter's life to do just that. Because even though Peter has failed, there is still a plan for his life. And so he asks Peter this question three times. Don't forget that Peter has denied Jesus three times. He is restoring him and redeeming him, giving him another chance. Three more chances, you might like to say. And Jesus is so incredibly gentle with Peter. Not once does he remind him of his failure. Not once does he point out his mistakes. He calls him by his name. Jesus is gentle with us when we mess up. There's this quote I love that you might have heard before by this guy called Ricardo Sanchez. And he says that the devil knows your name but calls you by your sin. But God knows your sin but calls you by your name. Peter was that guy, that guy who had messed up, who had let Jesus down. Perhaps he had labeled himself as a bit of a failure, a fraud. Perhaps he felt unworthy. I wonder what labels others might have been putting on him as well. But Jesus is interested not in what Peter has done, but who he knows that he can become. And this is how he sees him. And so each time that Peter answers Jesus, saying, yes, Lord, I do love you, Jesus gives him an instruction. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Jesus calls him out of his sin and his shame and back into the plans and the promises that God has for his life. Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me? Yeah? Well, let's go then, Peter. Let's go. I have great plans for you. Come and follow me. I still want to use you, Peter. The door is open, and I am calling you again. Getting to the end of this scene, I think it's a bit like that feeling you get at the end of a really good book or a film where it just stops, and you want to know what happens to the people that you have been following. We've seen Jesus meeting with Peter and restoring him. And the good news is that we can actually just turn over the page in our Bibles. Literally, if you've got a Bible open in front of you, turn over the page. And in the book of Acts, we read 
the next chapter of Peter's story. In the book of Acts, we read the story of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, we see that Peter is standing in front of crowds and proclaiming the good news about Jesus. This good news that he has experienced that Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, changes lives. He is boldly preaching the gospel, confessing his faith in Jesus. A public denial and now a public confession of faith. And then in Acts 2, 41, it says this. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. I think that is amazing. 3,000 new believers as a result of Peter's proclamation of the gospel, but more importantly, as a result of the restoration that Jesus brought Peter on that beach. There are so many different things, I think, that Jesus could have chosen to do in those days between his resurrection and ascension. I bet there were countless people he could have appeared to, places he could have gone, but he chose to come and meet with his friend Peter. And I think that that sums up what Jesus came to do. This is a picture of the gospel. The good news is that Jesus restores. Jesus is in the business of restoration. And his death on the cross and resurrection leads to restoration that brings dead things back to life. It helps lost things find their purpose. And it takes us from our pain into his promises. He takes our failure and he gives us another chance. He did it for Peter and he wants to do the same for us. Our God is a God who welcomes us back when we go wrong and he says, hey, I've still got a plan for you. A God who is for us and not against us. And he says, I still have a purpose for your life. My grace is sufficient for you. He did it for Peter and he can do it for us. Jesus restores. I'm going to invite the band to come back up. But I just love this story because I think it just shows us this is the good news. If you ever face a moment of failure, so did Peter. But Jesus restores. If you ever feel like a burden, so did Peter. But Jesus restores. If you ever feel broken, Peter definitely, definitely felt that. But Jesus restores. And if you're ever filled with shame, Peter, he felt that too. But Jesus restores. The power of the resurrection means that our stories can be rewritten. Peter's story was rewritten. He must have thought he had lost it all, but Jesus came and met him and restored him. The new life that Peter finds in Jesus that day on the beach is the same life, the same new life that Jesus longs to give you and me. And that is what he came to do. He loves to do it. He is desperate to do it. And he will do it for you and me as well. Amen.